music, don't you? It's wonderful hearing a young person praise the Lord like that. It's a blessing. If you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. We're going to continue our series in the book of Revelation. If you are using uh, your smartphone or a tablet and you have the Version app on the live tab, the keywords Bible CC and the titles Woman on the Beast, you can follow along there with the outline and the notes um, if that's what you choose to do. All right. Uh, if you haven't been with us, if you're a guest or a family member visiting or something like that, uh, we've been going through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. I'm not necessarily going to do a, an expository sermon over this entire chapter. There's a lot there. I do want to read the text and go through it. Um, give everybody an opportunity to at least be exposed to what it is that God's Word has said for you to hear the words, to see the words. Um, I'll talk about some, some concepts we found in this chapter, but always keep in mind, I, I say this, I'm not repeating it every Sunday because I think anybody's stupid or anything like that, so don't take offense if I repeat certain things, but I'm repeating them just so to help us, to remind us. Uh, maybe if you didn't hear it when I've said it before, just... Um, the ideas that are preached about when it comes to eschatology, prophecy of the end times, the book of Revelation, there's a lot of speculation out there. Uh, there's been date setting and these kinds of things that have come and gone and proven false. And many people have taken their speculation as being the truth. And I want to always and constantly remind you that the text itself, that the original text that was written, what God had inspired John to write and has been given to us, that is the truth. That is what's come from God. All these other ideas are merely our interpretation, our ideas, opinions, like I said, opinions that I've stolen from other people or borrowed, if you prefer that word. Uh, nah, I stole them, but that's all right. Um, Revelation chapter 17. We're talking about Babylon this morning, a concept that we've seen uh, quite a bit. We're also coming to the point of a chiasm in this particular book. And I, I explained before, if you're not familiar with what a chiasm is or a chiasm in Scripture, you find it in a lot of ancient texts, a chiasm or chiasm. Uh, imagine a point or a triangle, a chiasm in a literature. You have ideas that build to a point, something usually in the middle, and the, the order will usually go A, B, C, and then C is repeated, and then B and A. Just imagine A, B, and C being three concepts. The first concept is spoken about, the second concept is spoken about, the third concept is spoken about, and then it is repeated and emphasized. And then the second concept is spoken about again, and then the, the, the first concept is spoken about again, kind of goes up and down. Uh, Babylon, in the book of Revelation, we find that it is a chiasm that describes evil entities in this particular book. And it goes in that order where the devil or the red dragon is emphasized a few chapters earlier. The dragon is mentioned. And then the two beasts, the, the, the first beast and then the false prophet or the Antichrist, the false prophet are mentioned. Then Babylon appears, Babylon is emphasized, Babylon is destroyed, and those entities are destroyed in the reverse order. So they appear, the devil, the beasts, Babylon, and then Babylon's destroyed, the beast and the false prophet are destroyed, and then lastly, 
the devil is destroyed. This concept in literature wouldn't have been lost on this uh, first century. Those who could read that were familiar with writings in, this, in literature, this is a device that many authors have used. And the reason that they use that is to emphasize that middle point. Whatever it is that's at that tip of that chiasm, uh, imagine kind of like the tip of an arrow. This is the target. This is the thing I want you to pay attention to. Um, Babylon, um, Babylon uh, often appears in Scripture from the very beginning in the book of Genesis all the way through Revelation, and it is always uh, put as diametrically opposed to the city of God, which is Jerusalem, and you'll see that concept in the context of this book. And so let me go ahead and just start with the text, and we'll read through the chapter, and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Babylon. Starting there in verse 1, it says, this is the NIV, so I apologize if it doesn't match yours. It says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their, they have one purpose and they will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them. Hallelujah. Because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the king's of the earth. This is God's word, and may the Lord God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the scriptures. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that bears witness to the truth. Reveal your truth this morning to us. How will a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word? Cleanse our way. Clean up our lives, Lord, with your word. Warn us, caution us, teach us what is right. Teach us what is good. I need your help this morning, Lord. I need your Holy Spirit to guide me, guide the words of my mouth. 
guard this congregation. Guard their ears and guard their minds and hearts. Lord, if I say anything that's not of you, may it be forgotten. I have faith and I trust that your word will accomplish its work. Nothing can stop your word. Nothing can stop your truth. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your words shall endure forever. Be with us now. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Babylon's not a new concept. Here we're in the last book of the Bible in the book of Revelation. Babylon is not a new concept. It actually appears in the first book of the Bible in the book of Genesis. So you find um, the, the mention of Nimrod in uh, Genesis chapter 9. You have uh, Nimrod who appears in the genealogy of Noah. Uh, a curse was given. If you're not familiar, after Noah had gotten off the ark and his sons were there with him, his family was there with him, uh, there was a particular son by the name of Ham who came in while Noah was drunk and drunk in his tent. Ham came in and exposed his father's nakedness, had seen him naked. And we'd seen in the book of Genesis just a few chapters earlier in chapter 3 uh, that when sin had entered uh, Adam and Eve's life and their eyes were open, they saw their nakedness, that God, he took an animal and he, he killed that animal and, and it sacrificed it and made coats of skin to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame. And here later on you have Ham who uncovers the nakedness of his father Noah and a curse is placed on Ham because of that. Uh, you can go to Genesis chapter 9 and read all about that. Uh, the sons of Ham are spoken about in Genesis chapter 10, but the one who's in their line uh, by the name of Nimrod, it's said in there that he is a ruler over Babel, which is an early name for uh, Babylon. Uh, Nimrod's name actually means rebel, and, and the original name Babel, where you have the Tower of Babel, where Babylon comes from, uh, that name also means confusion. So here you have the rebel who is a leader of confusion, uh, historically, Babylon, uh, from the very first book, there's connections with wickedness, nakedness, shameful acts, um, idol worship. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the, with the story of the Tower of Babel, that this tower was built by men. They gathered together, and they were building a tower to heaven, trying to make a name for themselves. And God came down and confused the languages. You'll find that in the book of Genesis also. So historically, from the very beginning, uh, rebellion, uh, wickedness, these kinds of things are, are closely tied to Babylon. And later on in the book of Genesis, you find in chapter 15, uh, God had specifically said that he'd called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, if you're not familiar, the Chaldeans is another name for the Babylonians. Uh, the inhabitants of Babylonia are often referred to as the Chaldeans. Uh, this, they spoke Chaldea, these, these different things. It just depends on what language you're using. The Babylonians, the Chaldeans, they're the same people. Uh, Revelation chapter 18, we'll find in the next chapter, you have God calling to his people saying, come out of her, saying, come out of Babylon, come out of mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. It, it echoes all the way back to Genesis where God says, I've called you out to be my people. Uh, Daniel also uh, he begins his book in Babylon. It, he begins to write there. There are other uh, nations that rise up afterwards, uh, Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persian. But at the time of Daniel, when he was uh, just a young man, the Israelites were carried into captivity. Because of their sin, because of idol worship, because of wickedness, God had promised them that you'll go into captivity. This was fulfilled in Daniel's time, and it was King Nebuchadnezzar, you'll find this in the second book of the Kings, chapter 24, that uh, Babylon carries God's people into exile, all of them. Specifically, it mentions Jerusalem there, <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter 24, verse 15, it says, Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and the prominent people of the land. I find it interesting. I just highlighted this because it's an interesting concept that's found here. From Jerusalem to Babylon, the king's mother is mentioned specifically. It could have just said, you know, the king's family, his wives, his officials, but it, it specifically names the mother that is carried over to Babylon. The cities, uh, you find in culture that for some reason cities, I don't know if you might be one of these Chevy drivers or a Ford driver and you've got women's names for your cars. 
Is anybody in here one of those guys? If you're not, if you're a gearhead and you're familiar with guys that like to turn wrenches, for some reason they like to name their cars after women. But in the past, and even now today, we still call different lands, nations, and peoples uh, with a female uh, attachment to it. Even when we speak about this, this nation, we, we talk about the land that I love, stand beside her and guide her. There's this feminine quality that's always attached to cities and to lands and nations. Uh, and, and here, when Jerusalem's carried into captivity into Babylon, it mentions specifically the king's mother. There's two things that, are, that I want to point out to you. There is this, this opposition that is being made in Scripture. Do not miss this. In the context of the book of Revelation, Babylon is directly being opposed to Jerusalem. Revelation 17.5 says the, the name written on her forehead was Mystery Babylon, the great, the great, the mother of prostitutes, the mother of the abominations of the earth. Being referred to as the mother in Galatians 4.26, Paul says that Jerusalem that is above the earthly, the, or the heavenly Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and she is our mother. Have you heard it before saying that the church is our mother? You might have heard this concept that, that people are being born into the church, that the church is our mother and God is our father, that the church is the bride of Christ. This concept is not lost. From the very, very, very beginning of the book of Genesis where God says, man, it's not good for man to be alone, he uses family language throughout scripture. When he speaks to Abraham, I feel this needs repeating to, to make this point. When he speaks to Abraham in the book of Genesis, he says, come away from your land and your people. Go to a land that I will show you and be my people. And then all people in all lands will be blessed through you. That's the promise made to Abraham. Come out of your land, your people, your mother's house, your father's house. Go to my land, be my people, and then all lands, all peoples will be blessed through you. This family language is used throughout scripture, and it's not lost here when it comes to the concept of Babylon. Babylon is called the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. It's, it's implying that all these things are birthed through her. All this wickedness comes through her. But Jerusalem, which is above and is free, she is our mother. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, this opposition that we see in this chapter in Revelation chapter 17, Babylon, it's said is, is a city set on seven hills. Um, in the past, if you're not familiar with this, uh, some uh, speculation and some commentaries have been written and a lot of really good teachings that I think are uh, really good historically. We've talked about Rome. At that time, Rome was ruling at that, uh, in the region there in, in Asia Minor and throughout Europe and the readers of John's Revelation, they would have understood that, that Rome is a city that sits on seven hills. Um, in some translations, it's mountains, and to call that range in Rome mountains, I don't, I don't think it, it'd be like calling the Flint Hills mountains. Um, many times, though, Jerusalem, the area surrounding it is called Mount Zion or Zion's Hill, God's holy place. I only bring this up I bring this up because there are teachings out there where people will say that Rome is Babylon. There are some prophecy scholars that will talk about the Roman Catholic Church being the prostitute Babylon. That uh, in the past, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has had many ties to martyrs, those who have had true faith in Jesus Christ being killed, and that Rome is drunk with the blood of martyrs. I see where that reasoning comes from, but I think that it goes a lot further than that than merely just one particular church. But there are these different scriptures in Revelation chapter 17 that could allude to the church in Rome. Uh, be aware also that there are many people that read these verses in the book of Revelation and they see all these things uh, that, that could be about Rome, that could be opinions about Rome. Uh, they point it to being the United States of America. Now, I need you to be aware of this, that there are people that believe wholeheartedly, they even teach it, that the United States of America, once founded on biblical principles, has committed adultery with the world and gotten greedy, and that the United States of America is the whore Babylon. One of our um, uh, symbols is the Statue of Liberty, a woman who is carrying a light, a torch, sitting on the water. There are a lot of people that get offended when I talk like this. I'm not saying that I believe it. But I understand why they think this way. 
If you go into Revelation chapter 18, though, uh, there are some things uh, that make me not want to believe the Rome theory, or the, the, the Roman Catholic Church theory, because it starts talking about pearls and gold and frankincense and all these different things that are being traded. Now, typically, um, what we've seen in history and what you read in literature and studies about the Roman Catholic Church is a lot of these basilicas and cathedrals have been built on blood and gold. Uh, the crusades that happened, those kinds of things, a lot of money that has gone into that church, but they're not necessarily a trade state. The book of Revelation chapter 18, which we haven't gotten to yet, I'll get into more into that next week, talks about it being mainly a trade city. There are those that have the United States of America uh, theory that talk about the U.S. being the whore Babylon. They say that that makes more sense reading the 18th chapter because of our trade, because of our greed, because of the money that goes through here. If the United States was to be destroyed, as is described in the book of Revelation, people would weep because of how rich they've been made from the trade that happens in the United States of America. There's another theory also, I don't want you to get caught up in that and lost in those. Do your own study, do your own research. I don't necessarily believe the theory about the U.S. either. There's another theory that's been shared, um, and that is concerning uh, Saudi Arabia, concerning Mecca, uh, being a trade hub, specifically uh, Muslim, I don't want to cause hatred towards Muslims or Islam, and please don't misunderstand my words. If there's any Muslims listening by the internet or any in attendance, I just want to say I'm not trying to slam Islam or try to breed hate towards your religion. But the truth is, uh, by and large, Islam has been drunk on the blood of those who carry the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying, I'm putting that out there. I could be wrong. But there are those that say that they're doing God a service by killing the people of the book. It has been said, it has been said that Mecca in Saudi Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula, in that area of the world, that Mecca where it, uh, Muslims are going to gather to do the Hajj, where they pray towards Mecca. Uh, Muslims, they have their belief in Allah that that particular state, you don't talk, hear a lot about Saudi Arabia in the news, culturally, politically speaking, when it comes to wars and things in the Middle East. It's pretty quiet when we talk about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia makes a lot of money sharing its wine with the world. We call it oil. And the merchants of the earth are drunk with the trade that's gone on with oil around the world. The nations, the nations would shut down if the supply of oil was to cease, and so this is another theory. I'm not saying I believe this, I'm just telling you this is a theory that people have come up with based on these scriptures. Based on these scriptures. I'm not saying that it's scriptural, I'm not saying it's the truth. But people have talked about Mecca being that city because Mecca sits on a harbor, it sits on a port, on water, where trade is done. It's just the truth. Now I'm not saying that it's Babylon. But there are some of these descriptions that fit it. <clears throat> what I, what my purpose this morning, my purpose this morning is I need you to see the context of what the book of Revelation says about Babylon. Theologically speaking, in our study of God and what these scriptures actually have to say about Babylon, in the whole of the book, I can't go through all these chapters, but I want to show you these different things. That Babylon's talked about as being a city on seven hills, but in the very next verse when it says that, remember it also says that those seven hills are seven kings. That it's, it's metaphorical. Oftentimes hills and mountains in scripture are speaking about, they're speaking about kingdoms, about nations. That she's not necessarily sitting on uh, seven literal hills, but that her seat of authority is on the back of other nations and kings. And you go down to the 18th verse and it says it's the city that reigns over the rulers of the earth. Jerusalem is mentioned as a hill many times, mentioned as Mount Zion, and it's far from a mountain. But Jerusalem is spoken about as a mountain. When Jesus spoke of his people being the light of the world, he called us a city set on a hill. This phrase is used many times in scripture, not just about Babylon. 
Babylon reigns over the kings of the earth. I want to show you something in Psalm chapter 2, verses 2 through 7. It says, The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. In this chapter, in, book, in, in Revelation chapter 17, specifically Babylon is spoken about as being drunk on the blood of those who carry the testimony of Jesus. It's in opposition to the Messiah. It's in direct opposition to the Messiah. It's directly against Jesus Christ. Even here in Psalm chapter 2, it's referring to him being the king installed on Zion. Him being the king placed on Zion, the holy mountain. The kings of the earth are against him. There are these two sides that are being painted in scripture. These two sides that are being shown in these pictures. The kings of the earth and the king that God has chosen. Babylon being the city, the worldly system, or the worldly city, the worldly people, versus the heavenly Jerusalem, which is God's church, his people. Also, uh, Babylon's described as a prostitute. Revelation 17, 5 says, The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes. The heavenly Jerusalem is described as a bride. In Revelation 21, 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. These things are not an accident. These things are not an accident. In scripture, this idea of a prostitute, uh, it, maybe you read the King James Version in a lot of prophecies, especially in the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah, you find this word in the King James whoredoms, where your whoredoms have, have increased, your prostitution, your adultery, talking about the one who's cheating on her husband, the one who moves away from her husband and is fornicating with someone else who she's not married to. This concept is always opposed to the idea of the faithful bride, the one who's faithful to her husband, that is continually at his side, not fornicating with the world, but increasing in the relationship that she has with her husband. Look, in the context, think about this. In the book of Revelation, Babylon has two chapters that are dedicated to that city. Two entire chapters that are specifically about Babylon. Chapter 17 describes Babylon's depravity, and 18 describes its destruction. Jerusalem is also given two chapters. It's specifically given two chapters. And also, if you look at the structure of these chapters, I don't have it in my notes, the structure in these chapters, Babylon, the first chapter that describes it, the entire chapter describes it. The second chapter that describes it, the first half is specifically for it. The second half is an admonition for God's people. When Jerusalem is described in 21, the whole chapter is about Jerusalem's descent from heaven. Chapter 22, the first half is still a description about Jerusalem. You know what the second half is? An admonition for God's people. This is the context of the book of Revelation. These two cities are being perfectly placed against one another. There's a reason that there was two witnesses mentioned and then two beasts that follow. There's one child that rules with an iron scepter and a red dragon that has his third of the stars. It's not an accident. It's not an accident. The book of Revelation is structured specifically this way. This went a lot quicker than I thought it would. Um, the spirit of Babylon is something that we have to remember. It's something that is very similar to the beast that she rides. It's directly opposed to the Messiah and his people. I, I don't have time to go into a lot of those things uh, that are described here. But notice that it had how many heads? Seven. How many horns? Seven. We've heard that description not once but twice. When the red dragon appears, the exact same description. When Daniel talks about a fourth kingdom being upon the earth, the exact same description. The beast, after the red dragon, the beast who exercises the authority of the dragon has how many heads, how many horns? It's the exact same description. These ideas, he, he's re recapitulating, he's re-emphasizing, he's retelling the same thing. 
The spirit of Babylon, it's directly opposed to the Messiah and his people. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That the city itself, this woman, described as a woman, but she's not a woman, says that she's a city. Well, she sits on hills. Well, they're not hills. It says that those hills are kings. Don't get lost in all these pictures and metaphors trying to find out that exact nation, that exact person. The problem with a lot of eschatology and prophecy uh, teachings is that people are always trying to nail down an exact person, an exact city, an exact nation, and an exact date. Do you know that thousands upon thousands and hundreds of thousands of people thought that the world was going to end on the 28th of September? The only reason they thought that is because it didn't end on the 23rd of September. And it didn't end on the 13th of September either. It didn't end in May 12th, 2012. Neither did it end. It, I'm not trying to mock these people. or trying. I'm just trying to get you to see in Scripture these things are specifically described to us for this reason. Jesus spoke in parables in order to hide things. That way the prudent, the wise would see the spiritual truth. There are really two sides here. In some things, in some situations, I believe that there's a gray area. Not everything is black and white. But when it concerns salvation, when it concerns the identity of God, who Jesus Christ is, and what he did at the cross of Calvary, there's only two sides. Jesus said it himself. Either you believe or you don't. You're saved or you're condemned. John 3, 16, we quote it so, so well. People know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The rest of that chapter, he talks about the ones who don't. Even John the Baptist says, if you don't believe, you're condemned already and the wrath of God abides on you. There's two sides. There's two sides here in the book of Revelation. It's saying specifically who Babylon is against. That this woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people. That, that is implying, it's not specifically saying, but it's implying the idea that she is not one of God's people. Drunk on the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus is implying that she does not accept the testimony of Jesus. This is when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. This word is used four times. It might be more depending on which English translation, but in the Greek, the Greek word that is translated greatly astonished is actually used four different times when describing Babylon in these two chapters. That John is astonished, that the world is astonished, that the merchants and the trainers, traders are astonished, and then again that the world is astonished. That they're amazed when they look at her. How could this happen? <clears throat> now whether you believe that this is a church that's gone away from God. Uh, being an ex-Catholic, my mother was raised Catholic. And some of you here are ex-Catholics. You can see some of these things uh, concerning Catholicism. Of how at one time... Catholicism in one way tried to claim uh, allegiance to Jesus Christ, allegiance to God and following him, but then a denial and after denial of what God's word actually says versus what their popes say through the, through the years, you've seen that this church has gone far away from God's word. And if you look at the United States of America and you consider how we were founded on biblical principles, depending on uh, your views, there are some of us here, um, maybe you're one of those, I'm not necessarily one, but there might be some people that don't necessarily share that opinion that we were founded on biblical principles. There are some Americans that believe that we were founded by a bunch of terrorists that didn't want to pay taxes to the king and so we made a country of our own. We're a bunch of rebels. I could see where you would think that too, because in some ways I, I agree with that. I don't believe all of it, but if you look at your history, uh, the Boston Tea Party, it could be patriotic that they threw somebody else's merchandise into the harbor, or it could be destruction of property. 
Just depends on which side of the law you are standing on. Don't misunderstand me. I'm a patriot. I love my country. I know that I've been blessed being born here. But I know that this thing can't be propped up by men. That in order for this system and this nation to be righteous, it cannot be founded just upon the people and our opinions. That those biblical principles, those Judeo-Christian values must remain always for us to continue down the path of righteousness. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree with me, but that's my opinion. That I believe that the Bible contains values and a way of life that is best for people to be free and to enjoy liberty. And there are those that see the way that we are now, with the depravity, the wickedness that pervades our streets, shootings that are happening, these different kinds of things. And people look at it as though we were once married to God, but now we have committed adultery with the world. You may look at the United States of America as being the whore Babylon. And I understand if you think that way. I disagree. But I understand why you would think that way. And there are those of you, you love Jesus, you love God, and you have a lot of problems with Muslims and Islam. I understand that too. I understand that too. What you must know is that Muslims all around the world are having visions of Jesus Christ. They're turning from Islam and turning to follow the Son of God and put their faith in him at, at the cost of their own lives. That God is saving people in the Muslim world. We've had one of our missionaries that has come and shared during uh, Sunday school, uh, Nancy Austin, who had talked about some testimony of some of these things happening because of the work that they're doing over there in northern Africa and all those regions that are predominantly Muslim. But again, looking at that region of the world and looking about how much money goes through a lot of these Islamic republics, that's something that you don't hear a lot. You hear names like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. You hear these names, but consider that a lot of these countries, their official name, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Saudi Arabia, the Islamic Republic of they are uh, nations where religion and state have been married together, where there's no separation of church and state. Sharia law in a lot of those nations is the law of the land. It's a religious law that pervades their government also. And so for some, for some, when they look at those situations and they look at the region and they look at the, the religion of Islam, they think about the mystery Babylon, the one who is fornicating with the kings of the world, making the kings of the world drunk and rich. The traitors are very rich because of the oil that comes from that region. And I understand why you might think that way also. I don't know if I necessarily agree with any of those three theories. The reason I say that is because I've been wrong many times. I've been wrong more times than I've been right. The Bible never gives a name for the Antichrist. Therefore, I don't think I should give him one either. The Bible calls Babylon, Babylon. So I, maybe we need to leave it that way, that Babylon is Babylon. I don't know. I could be wrong about that too. I'm just saying. I'm just putting that out there. I don't want you to think that I'm fickle or that I don't make a stand on anything because I do make a stand. And it's in this verse right here. Those who bear the testimony of Jesus Christ. This phrase has appeared about six times already so far in this book. Not, instead of referring to them as God's people, instead of referring to them as the chosen one or the calling or the faithful, over and over and over again in the book of Revelation, this, chap, this little phrase is just spotted right in the middle of all of the destruction, all of the plagues, all of the suffering. There are those who bore the testimony to Jesus Christ. Before it said there are those that overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. 
The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This phrase is not new, and it appears again right here. That the woman's drunk with their blood. I want to ask the question of you. Instead, instead of trying to make a, a choice or an identity about who Mystery Babylon is, who do you say that Jesus Christ is? What is your testimony of Jesus? Where do you stand on this issue? Are you okay being a part of people who enjoy the ridicule of our Lord and Savior? Or are you one of those who are willing to give your life for your testimony about him? This is the choice that's always being made. Jesus Christ is always the point of contention. You might have had this conversation before. <clears throat> when you're in a room of people that describe how the universe does things and how, you know, the world, the way that the world is and, and the mention of God is spoken about and people are okay talking about God. But the moment you give God a name, the moment you start talking about Jesus, there's a division that's made usually in the conversation. Has anyone else experienced this before? When you're talking about God with people, we could talk about God and the maybes and the what ifs about God. But as soon as someone brings up Jesus, lines are drawn. There is a group that believe in him and there's a group that doesn't. That's simply what this book is doing. The name Babylon means confusion. Jerusalem is the city of peace. Isn't that interesting? And the one who's to be king from Jerusalem always causes division. Even Jesus himself said, think not that I came to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. That a mother and a daughter would be divided because of me. Father, son. That some people that your enemies would be of your own household. Jesus is the prince of peace. I believe that with all my heart. Jerusalem is the city of peace, but why is there so much turmoil over that city? Even now. The city of peace, the town of peace, or the door of peace, Jeru could be door. Shalom, Shalem, Jerusalem, the door of peace, the opening of peace. Why is there no peace? And we have a misunderstanding of peace. This word peace, Shalom, that's being spoken about with concern to Jerusalem, the Hebrew word is wholeness, unbroken, complete. It's not about an absence of war, it's about being complete. And I find that wars are breaking out in order to divide and break and split the city. Why is it so important? I apologize. There are a lot of things that aren't in my notes that I've said today. Um, I want to say, if you're listening on the internet also, that uh, I apologize if I've offended you in any way. That's not my goal. I just want to simply speak truth and talk about what the Bible says about these things. Share some of the theories that people have had concerning these chapters. Make up your own mind. Make up your own mind, whether you believe... It's the Catholics, a future church. There are some people that think about Babylon as being some future one world religion, that that will be mystery Babylon. Do your own research. Read the Bible for yourself. What's your testimony about Jesus? That's what I'm concerned with. Who do you say Jesus is? Which city are you a citizen of? Do you belong to worldly Babylon or do you belong to the heavenly Jerusalem? 
Jesus Christ is the door. He said it. John chapter 10, he says, I'm the door. If any man come in some other way, he's a thief and a robber. I believe there's many ways, many ways to find your way to Jesus. I believe wholeheartedly he's the only way to God. There is only one way to God. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. Your path to Jesus might look different than mine. You might go down a path that leads into destruction, drugs, alcoholism, and Jesus saves you out of that. You might have been obedient from your youth. You've always known about Jesus and you've always believed in him. God bless you too. I pray that he keeps you. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? For me, this is just, once again, just my personal opinion. Regardless of Babylon, Jerusalem, church, unchurched, religious or not, God, whoever. When I heard the name of Jesus and I believed that he was real and that he loved me and that what he did was true, I was set free from drugs and alcohol. See, in the name of Jesus Christ, I got set free from some bitterness and unforgiveness from my past. At the name of Jesus Christ, my life changed. Because of Jesus Christ, there's been reconciliation in my family. I can talk to my father like I've never talked to him before because of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, I, I, I met my wife. Because of his grace, we have our daughter, my two older kids too. Because of the grace that's in Jesus Christ. What's your testimony about Jesus Christ? What has Jesus Christ done for you? Maybe you don't have anything personally. You don't have a testimony that you can think of right now. Let me tell you what Jesus did for you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he came, he humbled himself, though he was God. He humbled himself and gave his life as a sacrifice for your sin, which you deserve the wrath of God for. But Jesus Christ himself took that punishment for you. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. And then, after he gave his life to the fullest and died, dropped every last drop of blood, he was buried, placed in a tomb. And on the third day, he arose again to justify you and show the world that what he said was true. That all that he spoke, all that he taught was truth and that he truly was a messenger from God, the very son of God in the flesh. That Jesus Christ. That's what he's done for you. Now what? Now what are you going to do with this Jesus? Now that you know that, is there anything else in your life that you can see that Jesus has done for you? Is there anything in your life that you need to be set free from today? Are you dealing with alcoholism, drugs, those kinds of things? Are you dealing with a porn addiction? Are you dealing with being worldly and always listening to music and watching movies that is not edifying to your soul? Are you dealing with an addiction to worldly things? Jesus Christ can set you free from that. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm not going to tell you that health, wealth, and prosperity is what Jesus Christ has for you. I can tell you with full confidence that you will be healed of every disease you ever have. Because Jesus makes this promise in his word that those who die in him will be raised to new life. You will have a new body that will live forever without sickness, without disease. So whether he heals you now or heals you at the resurrection, you will be healed. Are you suffering today? Jesus Christ himself suffered. He knows your pain. He doesn't make a promise to take you out of it. He promises to be present with you through it. Maybe you have a testimony. You might have been healed from some crazy sickness. That's awesome. I believe those things happen. Miracles do happen. 
But suffering happens also for God's people. We see it in here. Babylon was drunk with the blood of those who carried the testimony of Jesus. That tells me that there were those that gave their lives that they suffered because of their faith. They didn't get a free pass. I tell you what, though, when their eyes closed in the sleep of death, they were awakened and opened to see the face of their Savior. That's a hope that you can have today. Will everyone please stand with me for prayer? Father God, I pray that that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see the truth of your Son. Lord, I know that it's, it's the preaching of the gospel, that the preaching of the cross, that's the power of salvation. The gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Lord, I pray that we not be lost in trying to figure out everything about Babylon or Jerusalem, but that we would labor to know Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, that if there's someone here that needs to make a decision today and needs to share it with others, Lord, that you give them the courage to share this morning. Move them with your Holy Spirit. Show them that they're not alone, that they have a family here that is waiting for them, wanting to pray for them, to serve them and love them, to help them to follow you, to learn what it's like to be a believer. And if there's anyone here like that, Lord, I pray that you would just give them the strength to move forward today, to take a step. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, I, I hate cliches. I really do. I really hate saying them. But I mean it, though. If you have never chosen to follow Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, I invite you to come. It's not cliche with me. I really mean it. What I really mean is that with everything in your life, whether it's your job, your family, your friends, what you do with your life, are you trusting the Son of God? If you haven't started doing that, I want to invite you to come this morning. If you've never been baptized, if you've never been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible speaks of us making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You find that in the book of Matthew. You believe in Jesus Christ, but you've never been immersed in water. You've never been baptized. I want to invite you to come this morning and be baptized. The water is ready. I would love to do it. We would rejoice with you. If that's you this morning, please, please, I invite you to come. If you've backslidden, and that's one of those church words again, or it means where you've been following the Lord, but... You know you haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing. You haven't been coming to church. You haven't been praying. You haven't been encouraging. You haven't been living the life that Jesus has told you to live. If you've backslidden, if you've fallen into sin, if you've purposefully walked into sin, not just fallen, talk about fallen, tripping and falling. If you've purposefully made decisions that you know you shouldn't have made, I'm inviting you to come too. There is forgiveness for those things. I'm telling you, if you still have a breath today, God's mercy and forgiveness is extended to you. It's not too late. You have not messed up so much that you can't turn back to Jesus. He's calling you today. I invite you to come. If you need to make a decision and you need some people to pray with you, to talk with you, you just need some time to work through some of these things, I invite you to come.